Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Shannon Derejo from Crema Media. Welcome to our webinar, where our panel of speakers will showcase innovation in mining and mining services. Our webinar today is sponsored by ABB, AECI Mining, Astron Energy, and Epiroc. We thank them for their support in making this event possible. Before we begin, please be aware that we've enabled the Q&A function, so please post any questions into the Q&A. You'll find this on the panel at the bottom of your screen. Our panelists may not be able to answer all of your questions during today's hour-long webinar, but we will read through all of them. We have also enabled the chat facility so you can post your comments in the chat. You'll also find this at the bottom of your screen. Please do not, however, post any questions in there as we may miss them. You can post your questions into the Q&A. Please be aware that we are recording this webinar and we'll be sending it to you when it's available. We're also streaming the webinar live on YouTube and we'll share the link in the chat when it's available. Today's webinar will be facilitated by Eric Brucherman, the CEO of the South African Capital Equipment Export Council. He's a mechanical engineer with a wealth of experience and has worked for the African Development Bank and the World Bank on the economics of machinery and equipment. He's passionate about South Africa and its potential. Eric will facilitate the discussion with our panel, which consists of Lechloch Lonolo Malloy, the CEO of the Mining Equipment Manufacturers of South Africa, or MEMSA, Thomas Holtz, the Group CEO of Multitech Group of Companies, Vikesh Chiba, Business Line Manager for Digital Solutions at Epiroc, and Kevin O'Neill, Technical Director at Samira Trace. I'll hand over now to Eric Brucherman to start the discussion. Over to you, Eric. Thanks, Sharon, and good afternoon to everybody, and welcome to the webinar. Um, we also have today, as I've seen before earlier on, some 26 countries around the world joining us today on this uh, webinar, where we'll be talking about the innovation and showcasing our innovation in the mining and the industry that supplies all the mines around the globe. The aim of today is that our panelists share their experience, and we've got a wealth of experience sitting on our panelists. Um, and hopefully at the end of the day, for all the people locally and internationally, you will be inspired to see that the, the world has got a lot of difficulties. South Africa is not on its own when it comes to difficulties and difficult times. You just need to put on the television, and you can see the world is in a bit of a mess. And that just equals the playing field for all. So we're not here today to moan or to groan or to talk negative about any country or any government. And we're here to, to explain to people that when you see innovation, you know you're going forward. And all companies around the world that are successful and many of the companies that are here today that are on the panel have won international and local awards for exporting and for innovation. And they know what innovation is. And innovation, you can talk about Henry Ford or some of these people around the world that started big innovations. But most of the innovation comes from ordinary people like you and I that come up with a good idea. And sometimes you have a look and say, wow, why didn't I think of this idea? And they are just absolutely perfect examples of innovation. I'll just start off by just telling you about SACIC. SACIC is the South African Capital Equipment Export Council. It's been going for 23 years, and it's a public-private partnership that we have with the Department of Trade and Industry. And ourselves, there are 17 export uh, associations in South Africa. And we export in the region of 178 billion rands worth of mining equipment, machinery and equipment, which relates to approximately 7 billion US dollars per year. Uh, at SACIC, we, <coughs> excuse me, we also have partners and we cannot do what we do in the mining industry without partners. And we have partners like MEMSA, who you will hear from just now, SAMPEC, VAMCOSA, Manufacturing Circle, and we all work closely together and we have to work closely together because to take on the challenges of Africa or the world or to export around the world and to showcase our initiatives, um, it is quite a task 
And I believe that we in South Africa are very successful at this task and doing this task. I also just quickly want to mention, and especially for our overseas visitors on today, that in September 2024 in South Africa, we've got our Electro Mining Africa exhibition. It's most probably the second biggest exhibition in the mining industry. And all the people that you'll hear about today will be there. Um, Crema Media, who put up this webinar, will be there. And it will be nice for you to visit South Africa. There's over 850 exhibits exhibiting at this exhibition, together with a local manufacturing expo. And they also have approximately 33,000 visitors walking through the exhibition um, during the week. So it is really where we can showcase whatever we do in South Africa. And just to welcome everybody, and um, we're going to start asking, I'm going to ask each panelist three questions, and they're going to talk about the innovations and the great stuff that they do. And hopefully at the end, we will all be inspired by what they say and what they do. And you can see that industry continues no matter what the difficulties are. And the first person I am going to be asking a question to is Le Holonolono from Moloi, from the mining equipment manufacturers of South Africa called MEMSA. And he is the CEO of the mining equipment manufacturers of South Africa, a cluster of more than 60 local original equipment manufacturers and service providers. He has over 25 years experience in process metallurgy and executive management at major mining firms. So a gentleman with a wealth of experience. And my first question is going to go, and I have to ask the, what does or how does South Africa's mining technology know-how compare globally? Thank you, if I can ask you that. Yeah, uh, thank you, Eric, and uh, good afternoon, colleagues, uh, South African time. And it's an honor and a privilege to be part of this panelist and part of this very uh, exciting uh, webinar. Yes, and I think, you know, uh, based on your question, one's got to also uh, maybe just take a step back and say, where does South Africa innovation and technology come from? I mean, we've got an in excess of 100 years of mining experience and having a specialty also in the hard rock, you know, specialized uh, low profile seams, both in the hard rock and soft rock. And I think that that kind of challenges that we've seen over the years in the mining industry has led to the innovation that we are seeing in the country. And that level of innovation is driven by nonetheless by South Africans who understand the, the challenges of the mining industry and the challenges of the industry itself. But over and above that, one of the key things that have driven that is, is improvement on safety, not just production. And those that speak for themselves, if one looks at how the numbers have declined in terms of fatalities in the mining industry to where we are. And that could have never happened without the collaboration between all the key stakeholders, which is the Mine Health and Safety Council, the DMRE, and uh, the, the Minerals Council, and all the manufacturers that play a big role within the, the mining sector. So, you know, and I think that that part of collaboration in those key aspect areas where it's needed, especially when you speak to safety, is very important. And I think that speaks to also the level of innovation that we've seen happening in South Africa, specifically around the, the level nine uh, collision uh, policy that has came out from the DMRE and how South African companies have risen to, 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 to face that challenge, obviously in collaboration with the mines. And I think it's very important to just say that, you know, a pound for pound, we South Africa has proven that we know mining and pound for pound, we can even see from the numbers we've mentioned in terms of exports, uh, both continentally and into the world, that that has grown. And I think you know some of the logistics that we've seen uh, in terms of the challenges we're seeing in the procurement space have led to those opportunities uh, uh, happening and also exposing South Africa as a key manufacturer within the mining supply chain. I hope I've answered your question, Eric. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. I, and, and, and just to add on it, it's, it, it's good to see that there are so many people and, and, and the health and safety is one of the important factors in mining. And I think South Africa has got an incredible, fantastic record and we are absolutely leaders in, in all of this that we do. Thank you so much. My next question will go to Thomas Holtz and from Multitech. And Thomas Holtz has a BSc Mechanical Engineering as well as a postgraduate diploma in Industrial Engineering. 
His career with uh, Multiplex started in 1996, where he now serves as the CEO. So you can see, ladies and gentlemen, that we're all aging on this. And so we do have a wealth of experience. But my question to, to Thomas is, Multitech is addressing current challenges. And I know Multitech has won many awards locally and internationally. And the question is, the mining companies and, and, and what they do is through your mineral processing, what are the challenges being faced at the moment, uh, Thomas, that your company faces and the innovations that you have to do to keep the mines processing equipment alive and well? Thomas. Thanks, um, Eric. Um, I'm in denial. I'm definitely not aging. Um, so uh, I think, uh, yeah, I'll say uh, uh, my gray hair gives it away, but unfortunately, can't run away from that. Um, thanks for the intro, Eric. Yeah, from Multitech's point of view, um, we're a proudly South African company manufacturing equipment here, predominantly in uh, Kauteng, um, exporting to many destinations. And we pride ourselves with having fairly direct access to mine sites and to mineral processing applications. So we have a fairly wide infrastructure spread throughout Africa in particular, but even in South America, Australasia, um, across into uh, some, of the, some of the mining applications up north uh, in the Middle East, which is obviously very contentious at the moment, and um, all the way up through to Sweden and even into, into, uh, into Russia, at least in the past. So um, our um, experience is very much related to the application. So understanding the application, if there's a requirement to do dry screening, which in dry countries, water is a problem, we, we offer a dry screening product, which is quite different to a wet screening product. Um, so we do a lot of, one of our core businesses is screening, um, not screening machines, screening media, and we're probably one of the most sophisticated suppliers of screening media, whether it's made from stainless steel or some other form of special steel, polyurethane, rubber, you get it, you name it. I mean, we probably have 10,000 plus variations on the topic. Um, we, we will supply that into the industry and we say it's fit for purpose. So uh, we don't want to reinvent the wheel. Um, every mine site has its uniqueness and we do develop a customized solution to those applications. So very much following the customer and satisfying the needs that they have. Um, we also do focus uh, some of our capital equipment um, to assist with the water story um, where uh, mining companies can't um, process, need to reprocess their water because they don't also uh, have, have enough water, but they don't have slime stamps licenses. We offer uh, uh, filter presses and centrifuges in that arena. So we, we, we're, we're developing, obviously, to, to, to adapt into an environment depending on, on, on the client's needs and the applications. More and more remote areas on the, on the planet are providing us the minerals that we require, and we need to move into those areas. We obviously know in Africa, West Africa for gold, Central Africa for copper. We, we're in those places, and we develop as we see fit. I think I can talk a little bit more, but I'll maybe leave that for a later question, um, Eric. But yeah, we're a proud supplier of South African-made product into most mining destinations in the world. Just a quick question before I let you go on this question. What, what is the amount of R&D that Multitech tackles on a daily basis, on a weekly basis, especially when the challenges are coming from the mines with whether it's in South Africa or in Africa or anywhere else, Thomas? Yeah, I'd love to give you a percentage on revenue. Um, I can't because I'm embarrassed. It'll, it's not enough. Um, <laughs> we, we, we do have extensive R&D facilities. We do also do a lot of testing of the material that we get from the mine sites. We have a, we have a quite an expansive facility just uh, around the corner here where we, we can bring samples of customers, uh, uh, the, the, the minerals that they want to separate because we also offer guarantees on, on the product. Um, so we need to be able to test it and then offer that guarantee. We do, um, you know, on, on R&D for us, it's, 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 a, it's a no brainer. 
The question is, what's your appetite? I mean, I, I can tell you we're not a software company, so we're not spending 4% of our revenue. Um, we, we wouldn't survive as a business in that space, but it's, it's, it's significantly less, but quite substantial. If you don't do that investment, um, you're, 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 you're going to drop behind. It's, uh, there's no question um, that that is absolutely essential for the survival of your business. So we, do, we, we also differentiate between product development, which is refining the product offering, into a particular application as opposed to pure R&D where we're just virtually doing the blue sky stuff, testing new ideas, uh, new products. Um, and that's that we, we, we do that as well. And we do that at different locations. We have a, 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 a newly established um, factory in, in China and they've, built, they've made us some amazing equipment but based on the capabilities that they have in that, in that factory. Um, so yeah, we we depending on the area we're in, um, in Chile, for instance, we've specialized on sampling equipment, and uh, we've got some class leading sampling equipment coming out of our Chilean operations. Um, so yeah, I, I could go on, but I think that's it for now, uh, Eric. Thank you, Thomas. Much appreciated. Yeah. Um, our next panelist is Vicky Chiba, and he has a diverse background in engineering projects and business management specializing in automation and digital solution for the mining industry. Vikesh currently serves as a business line manager and automation product manager. So the question to you, Victor, is what are some of the latest technology advancements in mining equipment and support services, especially regarding drilling and rock excava uh, excavations? Vikesh? You... Thanks very much, Eric. Um, and good afternoon, good morning, to all the participants. It's, it's truly a pleasure and an honor to participate in the webinar this afternoon. Um, so maybe I'll start off with a bit of context. Um, you know, Epiroc has traditionally been a yellow machine manufacturer, uh, manufacturing company, but we've made several strategic acquisitions in the last few years within the mining technology space. Um, so we are bolstering our technology capabilities. Um, the, the acquisitions has resulted in our digital and automation portfolio being quite broad. Um, you know, if I think about the products ranging from remote and autonomously controlled machines, we have real-time situational awareness tools. Um, we have telematics platforms that allow for machine health and productivity, monitoring and reporting. Uh, we also offer collision prevention systems, commonly known as um, or termed as CAS um, in the in the mining space. But we're motivating for <laughs> the transition from CAS to CPS, so we're all talking the same thing. So that's in line with the the definitions in terms of the South African regulations. Um, and we also have advanced so uh, software packages for mine design planning and short interval control. Um, it's worth noting that all of these systems are fully agnostic uh, that we offer from Epiroc. Uh, so you can basically install the these solutions on any piece of equipment, whether it's Epiroc or not, which is something that we're quite proud of and gets us excited. And um, you know, all of these products are in continuous development, um, but at the moment, there's a large amount of focus around the integration of these various platforms. So essentially, we're driving towards having a single solution with different technology plugins, uh, depending on what our customers need. Um, you know, whether it's uh, productivity, efficiency, or safety improvements. But I, I guess, Eric, to, to answer your question in terms of some of the latest developments we've been working on, um, we, we recently launched our, our real-time location uh, tracking system for surface mining applications. Uh, it's called Blast Supports. It's essentially a uh, 3D visualization of people's location um, within the mine site um, to ensure that no person uh, is in the danger zone during blasting. I mean, these uh, the, the system can also track um, assets um, apart from people with a fixed or moving assets. Um, and it's really cool in the sense that you have a 3D map that uh, you can visually see where all the people and assets are. Um, and this this surface platform has been built on our tried and tested real-time location system, uh, which has been used in underground applications in South Africa. We currently have four sites in South Africa where we're using the underground real-time situation tool. Um, there's also been some significant leaps in terms of machine automation. Uh, we, we recently launched our interoperable remote and autonomous operation platform for surface uh, drills. So essentially, an, an operator is able to control a range of autonomous 
um, uh, platform and corridors from a common operating platform. So that's quite a big step. We call the system CAP or Common Automation Platform. And we think that's quite a game changer in the surface drilling space. Um, in the in the underground automation space, we have successfully completed testing and demonstrated fully autonomous material handling. So that's from face to the loading point. Um, I think something that's also got us quite excited is in the, the CPS or CAS and the collision prevention space, we've launched Epiroc's Titan CXD system to the market, uh, which has been designed and developed in South Africa. It's also primarily assembled in South Africa by a company called Monarch Electronic, which we acquired in, in 2022. Uh, and while CPS or CAS is not new in South Africa, this, this, project, this product is quite exciting in the sense that it combines various sensor technologies, including GPS, low frequency, radio frequency, time of flight, and AI cameras, um, depending on the specific underground or surface um, operating conditions. Um, and that, you know, that combination significantly, significantly increases the, the likelihood of the CPS system detecting a personal vehicle. Um, we're obviously also working closely with the University of Pretoria around that. So there's a lot happening in the space and I think that the developments will continue. Thank you, thank you very much. And it sounds interesting and it's, you know, <clears throat> with all the different panelists and we're now gonna go to Kevin O'Neill uh, from Sumeria Trace. And, and Kevin O'Neill is considered the father of radio frequency identification in South Africa. He's led the RFID, which is Radio Frequency Identification Institute, over the last 30 years and has developed solutions for a wide range of industries and leading companies. And Kevin, my question to you is, what inspired the development of your blast-resistant tracer and what role does the technology play in the mining process? Kevin? Okay, very good question. Um, yeah, well, just a quick background. We were always since about 1988 the control and instrumentation process automation company, and um, you know, measuring every sort of product or process that you'd imagine. And in about 1998, we needed a technology that we could read non line of sight on some certain products that you cannot read, you can, cannot me manage what you cannot me measure. And it was actually in the paint ovens in the automotive industry. So we brought in this radio frequency identification technology, which is basically a microchip that works on radio waves to identify it, non-line of sight technology. And that was brought in for one of the common manufacturers in the country for this system. and in. In 2001, we were approached by the mining industry, one of the large mining groups, which is in Kumba Resources, to see if we can come up with this technology to track an ore body from A to B, because we were in track and trace systems, traceability, and real-time information on the traceability of a product. So we went into almost there are we were almost based on their R and D to develop this product for them. So we thought, well, very simple. We took on we took on the project and you know, not knowing too much about the material handling and all bodies and that type of stuff. It's not as simple as just throwing an RFID tag at point A and measure it at point B, because then you're just measuring the tag. So we went through a lot of research and development with all the mining groups over the next like five years developing the ore tracer, that we could put this tracer into the ore and it must remain and have the same characteristics as the ore. You know, mainly shape, size, SG, um, behavior, same characteristics. So that took quite a couple of years to get that, just the product right. Um, so you don't get segregation in the ore and that, and you track the ore body with this product. And then obviously once we'd achieved what we were set out to be, the guys and... Obviously, one of them was how would you distribute these traces? What volumes would you put per ton? Do you want to do tracking or do you want to do management? So all those things were trialed and, 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 and run over the years with, the, with um, most of the guys. And then once that was finally finalized, obviously the milestone became, can we put them within the blast? So we don't have to proceed them afterwards. So it'd be with the whole body right from the blast. And what's the thing? So it took about another five years a lot of hard work together with CSR and 
some of the explosives companies in the country. And we tried and tested it out till we got the product right that could survive the blast. And then obviously to try and see well, what percentage of them last of the blast. Yeah, and um, then take them through the plant, can it survive the crushing, the cyclones, etc. Go through the plant and go out for all transfer to the stockpile management right to customer. So for stockpile mapping, retention times in the plant and things. So we developed the software around it that it could be a real-time locating software of your, any of your whole body to be used for grade control management. Yeah? But don't do the grade control management, we provide the tool to identify the all. So after, I'd say, almost 10 years of testing and trials with, I'd say, every mining group in the country, we had a different underground to surface, different um, platinum, mainly iron ore and coal. We did our trials with Exaro and the Kumba iron ore. And, um, yeah, that was how the product was in fact one The idea we popped up with, it was the industry, the mining industry that approached us and taught us a lot of what the requirements were. And I've been in the process control industry since I started the business in 89 and started working with control and automation in 78 already. So it was a big challenge for us. And since then, we've just been on and on continuously improving the product. Thank you. Thank you. And, and, and it's interesting to see. And, and if you have a look at so far, you've now had every one of our panelists say something in the mining industry. And, and it's amazing what actually goes on and, and the, the designs and, and what actually happens. And, you know, people talk mining is a short word, but if you see the complications and the amount of technology that goes into a single mine, it is absolutely mind-blowing. Thank you for that, Kevin, and we'll come back to you now. now. Um, I'm going back to Lehe Unonolo for a second question. And the question I'm asking is, how is local mining technology responding to the energy transport and water crisis? And the second part of that question, have you found that there's government support and industry uh, collaboration in taking place to help build the sex the sector? Yeah, no, thanks for that question. And I think that the question, the answer to your question is resilient, you know, and I think the resilience of the South African manufacturers uh, uh, in, in terms of with all the challenges that we're having from electricity to the logistics part of it, and we've seen the delays at, at the ports and stuff like that. But I think, you know, all, all in all, and given also the challenges that we see with the commodity prices, um, especially coal and, 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 and the PGMs, Really, it's, it's been tough for a lot of manufacturers to, to be able to sustain the businesses. But, you know, uh, I think that level of creativity that exists within South African manufacturers have given them that flexibility that, you know, us as, a, as, a, as an industry cluster, we've never lost one member during all this time where there's been challenges in the industry. In actual fact, we've grown from, uh, I think, when the time I joined MEMS about three years ago, from 35 to about 70 members to, to date. And that just goes to show that the industry is, is quite optimistic about uh, 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 the South African mining industry. And I think also the, 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 the advent of the Africa free trade area is quite exciting for the local manufacturers to look at the opportunities that the continent presents itself. So, yeah, the South African manufacturers have been quite resilient with all the challenges faced. And I think one thing I has got to mention is we've had very strong uh, uh, engagements from a provincial level because most of our members are based in, in, in Kauten province in South Africa, and the engagement around how best to work around the issues of electricity. We have engagements with, uh, uh, for instance, Ekurileni uh, municipality, where we're looking at different options from, uh, I mean, uh, load curtailment. Thomas and I participate in a, in a, in a committee that, that speaks to industry, between industry and uh, a, a local government around how best you can support the industry looking at flexibility between the, 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 the municipalities and ESCOM. And again, you know, around issues of logistics, uh, the collaborative effort between our members to say, how best can you find a common supplier, a common service provider, that we can give them the volumes to be able to assist us to make sure that uh, whatever products they need to get out of South Africa and also in from the uh, uh, supply chain is, is fast-tracked. So yeah, 
the, 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 the industry has been resilient, but yes, we've taken the, those challenges to the chin and that hasn't come easy because some of those costs, you cannot transfer them to your, uh, uh, to the, to your client. You've got to somehow find a way to cushion that and hope that, you know, through all this process with everything happening, you don't go under, you survive. But I have to say, we've never lost a member who's gone under. Instead, we've grown as an industry, and that shows the positiveness that we have in terms of the South African mining industry. Now it's going to turn around, and obviously the continent. Thanks, Eric. Yeah, thanks. And I and I think if you have a look at it, and earlier I mentioned the export numbers that are growing, and you know, it, there's a lot of people with a lot of negativity around. But if you have a look at business, and you have a look at the innovation in business, and 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 the ways people are working together, I mean. In South Africa, as I said earlier, every organization that you can think of in the industrial technical space, mining space, is working together to help industry to strive and be successful. And I think that's where we are. Thanks so much for that. And my next question to Thomas is, Thomas, are there any success stories that you could share with us from a uh, multi-tech solution that have considerable impact on the profitability and sustainability of some of the mining operations and as far as you're concerned, the South African mining companies continue to invest in new mining technology and mining service. And why is that important, Thomas? Thanks, Eric. Um, yeah, let's just start off with this word resilient. Uh, uh, sometimes uh, I think us South Africans are getting a bit tired <laughs> of being resilient. <laughs> um, it's a challenge. We deal with the deindustrialization as a factor, which is a phenomenon. I think one of the questions I saw earlier was around is this manufacturing industry growing? I think this mini manufacturing industry is struggling. Um, so it's a challenge. You know, you 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 have to have to have a mindset of taking on the challenges, putting in the power required, and being capable of 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 dealing with the the, the load shedding, the uh, load curtailment, um, and sometimes uh, many other factors that, that we have to deal with. Um, that notwithstanding, I have to say at, at Multitech, we, we've taken the bull by the horns and, and you know, I think we've, we've taken the challenge on. Um, and we do feel that we've got a great story to tell. You know, just as an example, in, in, in US dollar terms, Multitech has grown since uh, the 1994 we talk about a transition to, to date to 2024, 10 times in US dollars in revenue, you know, um, and substantial portion of that was export related. So we do feel we've got something to offer. We do feel if you have the mindset of a world-class business with people that own that mindset, rather than think that in the Southern part of Africa here, yeah, we don't have the skills and we're not capable and we, we have to overcome all these challenges. Well, then, then you you you're not going to make it. Um, you have to put your head down. But uh, just to your question, Eric. Um, yeah, I mean, we've had a number of innovations which I can talk to. I I, I think depending on this audience, some of it is very specific. Um, for instance, a quick and easy one is we've developed a UX7 um, spiral, which uh, is used to beneficiate Chrome. And in this particular instance, this particular spiral has been able to recover a much more efficiently than this fraction below 75 microns, if that means anything to anybody. Um, that fraction was lost in the past, but uh, it's now recovered. So it allows that uh, that operation to, to recover a, 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 a larger portion of its of its mineral. In the past, that wasn't the case. Um, Eric, you'll know, and, and we, 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 we won the award on the pulping shoot, which replaces um, a, a scrubber. So we take the the scrubber runs. It's a it's, it's it needs a motor. It needs a some moving equipment. Uh, it saves energy. Um, there's a lot of wear on it. Whereas the pulping chute's made out of ceramics. It's a static item. Serves the same purpose. Typically used in the mining industry. Um, and uh, that that is that has been one of our innovations. I'm uh, I'm just mindful of time, but I think one of the last one is we've we've developed. With the integrated liner, which we call the Makulu liner, which uh, in the mill lining applications has partly replaced some of the steel liners, and it's a composite rubber steel. Uh, it's quicker to install it because uh, it, it's lighter. It's because it's integrated. You have less parts to install, so there's less of a shutdown required. 
And in some instances, we've proven uh, in the copper belt that uh, we can get a higher throughput with that liner in the mill. So, yeah, we've, we've, we've done a fair amount of development and obviously to the benefit of, of our clients. Oh, thanks, Thomas. And I know um, that you've won many, many awards and we congratulate you guys on this because obviously they don't come easy and there's a lot of work that goes behind that. If I can now go back to Vikesh and just ask the question, to what level has the uh, digitization and even artificial intelligence begun to impact on South Africa mining operations? And how does Epiroc ensure that the technology advancement you offer are fit for purpose? Vikesh, thanks, ask- thanks, Eric. Um, yeah, I think, you know, digitization specifically has gained huge momentum over the last decade. Um, and it's had a significant impact on the on the local mining um, sector. I think um, uh, mines that are not digitizing the information um, is at a serious or are at a serious disadvantage. Um, so if you, if you think about the traditional manual paper-based methods um, of the past, um, these were typically prone to human error, loss of information, um, and slow processes to consolidate the data. Um, but if you think about digitization, where collection, storage, conveying of the data is is happening at a blink of an eye, much faster, much more accurate, um, it's it's a base requirement. And I think you know in our space, uh, we drive data and uh, digitization um, essentially for more effective management decisions. Um, that's what it boils down to at the end of the day. So we we leverage. Technologies uh, such as sensors and controllers linked to IoT devices, um, uh, information gathered through tablets. We use various types of tags, um, uh, RFID technologies, um, and and connectivity through Wi-Fi and LTE uh, to collect and transfer the data to service server-based applications. Um, you know, once it's once it's um, collected and stored, uh, you know, there's different software packages available in the market, but we actually uh, can offer packages that can combine data from different sources, consolidation um, for for mine design, for planning, and for scheduling uh, purposes. Um, and, uh, you know, the technology we have, you know, these the sorts of information, if you think about planning and scheduling, can be sent to machines and operators um, in near real time. Um, so the, the digitization has become um, very, very streamlined, um, and it's something that uh, you know we even use internally within Epiroc quite effectively. Um, from an AI perspective, uh, I feel we're really only scratching the surface of what is possible in South Africa, um, and there's there's huge opportunity for us to leverage AI um, and artificial intelligence to have a greater impact. Um, if I think about our solutions, you know, we have a, as, as mentioned a bit earlier, we have a broad range of autonomous solutions for, for drilling, loading, and and haulage, both in underground and surface operations. Um, these uh, these solutions essentially allow machines to be operated and controlled through very complex AI algorithms um, and are able to communicate and coordinate with each other. In a in a very orchestrated way to get the maximum possible utilization from the machines. Now we do have a, a handful of sites in South Africa that are running uh, autonomous surface trolls, but there's limited applications in, I think, both the surface haulage space and the the underground mining space. And I think that um, that is because there's still some work to do in terms of the operational maturity that's required before we can take that next step to uh, fully autonomous systems. Um, however, there are there are areas where AI is is being used quite routinely. Um, you know, if I think about in terms of software, for example, our design planning and scheduling platforms basically use algorithms to simulate mining operations and predict outcomes based on different scenarios and operational constraints. Um, you know, we can we can talk about design of mining layouts, planning uh, the sequence of extraction, uh, optimizing the transport of materials. Um, so there's there's a lot happening in the software space. But if I think about, you know, what's happening in terms of AI related hardware, 
Um, AI cameras, for example, are using being used more and more in mining. Um, and I guess an example is the the AI camera that we fit onto our CAS or CPS system, uh, which is able to detect people and assets that don't necessarily have a tag or any form of uh, detection device on them. Um, and that just adds an extra um, layer of safety. Okay. Um, yeah. Thank you. Thanks. And we'll get back to you just now again. Uh, thanks. If I can go to Kevin for the last questions here as well. Um, in, in the RFID, uh, Kevin, where have you trialed this technology and what results have been achieved? And secondly, what innovation such as yours critical to ensure sustainability in the South African mining industry um, and in the mining industry worldwide? Uh, Kevin, if I might call you. Yeah, thanks, Eric. Um, yeah, I think we, we did predominantly our trials started right at the beginning with um, in Rosh Pina of mine, with a small mine that we could control the environment and to track the ore body. So with the tracking of the ore, there's a lot of components. So we take it from pit to plant or from underground to plant. And then we moved on to the, the, the bigger mines where we did from the blasts to the plant at Sishan Mines. Mostly through the iron ore, all the iron ore mines, um, coal with Xara, Frutahilic. We tiled it with the Richards Bay Coal Terminal for the um, stockpile management and blending beds. So, um, and the whole Anglo Platinum Group was there tonight. So, we took different components of the mining one and trialed it just with one sort of mining group, not doing the same trials over and over. And um, one of the main things being in the pit was to identify your grade for and your ore and your waste to prevent ore to waste, waste to ore, which is the biggest thing. And then in the plant, obviously, the plant efficiencies of a plant and um, to test the survivabilities of the traces through crushes and et cetera, what the survival rates would be. So every little component uh, we'd, we'd, we'd measure out. The diamond industry, we did a lot with Lexing diamonds in the Sutu. Namdeb on the seabeds, we'd all the traces in the seabeds of Deb, uh, Namdeb and Deb Marine. So we've done extensive testing through almost every part of the industry, how many gold from the underground to surface. So, um, yeah, and the money to, 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 to track and trace, you know, planned versus actual. Are you getting what you actually predicted? So we'd get blast plans and all grades and that and put it into our system. What we also did was to, we, you know, mining was is very silo. You got your sampling geology, you got your blasting, you got your hauling, you got your plant, then you got your all transfer, stockpile management, etc. It was all silent. So we had to develop a software platform that could integrate to each one of these and make it our own real-time platform so that you could track it right through each one without having to go to each silo and get the information. So um, you know, we have the digital ID, non-erasable ID on the on the ore tracer that goes travels with the so your ore body the whole time. So we're totally in control of it. And um, as I said, I think the main thing is what is planned, so we get the plan, and we can measure towards actually coming into the plant, what you're actually hauling. And I think the main big improvement is the the, 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 the quality control and grade control, management of your ore, and knowing what, you, what you're hauling, and, and um, having it verified at a tip, what grade is coming in, what ore is coming in, is it what's planned, you know, the blast movement that we get in a block is quite amazing. We, on some blocks, we found got up to 15 meters of movement in a blast block. Um, so to predict on the demarcation lines, people what to think they're hauling, they're actually not. So the ore tracers managed to help identify this. And, you know, that's a big improvement in, in the quality on, of your grade going out. And variation. So we basically trialed with every different mining industry, and you know, from platinum, from uh, iron ore, coal, Eskom power stations. We did the coal retention times to surgeons, um, the different grade control of the ores coming in from the, the, the mines that feed it. So, yeah. I don't okay. think there's right. a case we haven't trialed over the last, and that's all taken, it's a 20 year. Challenge we've had almost just on 20 years now. Again, we've been as, smoothly as, for the last five years. Yeah. As I've said earlier, Kevin, it, it, it's absolutely amazing.
to see the technologies and, and, and the strides forwards that we go into. Um, we've now got a whole lot of questions from our viewers. And I think the easiest is I'm going to read out a question and if our panelists will raise their hand to see who wants to answer that particular um, question that we have got. Um, and the one question is, and the first question that came up earlier, so it says, how does the mining industry bridge the language gap between operator and senior management? Um, and is Fanga, Fanaga law still effective? Is there anybody that uh, wants to answer this? I know that the mines are, you know, Fanaga law is, is, is the language and I don't think it will ever change in the South African content. Is there any yeah, other question? Yeah, maybe if I can just come in on that one. Um, one's got to be able to to acknowledge that you know uh, our government, from at the national level, has played a big role in terms of participation in the mining industry, and this was done through the Mandela Mining Precinct, which is uh, one of the most successful tri triple piece between uh, the Department of Science and Innovation and the Minerals Council of South Africa. And one of the programs that the Mandela, Mandela Mining Precinct is running is called SETCAP which is a successful successful application of technology centered around people. And one of the things that when, when this launch of the different projects that the Mandela Mining Precinct did and ran is that they invited the unions, different unions, you know, from NUMSA to, sorry, to NUM and, uh, and all the other uh, unions to, to be part of the journey of uh, 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 the Mandela Mining Precinct, but also to say whatever technology that's gonna be introduced into the mining industry is going to be communicated. And some of the technology speaks to the, uh, the language barriers. And hence, that's why the issues of ABET that have been applied in the past to say, you know, train your people at least they can be language competent. And I think there's been a, quite a huge success if one looks at the, the ABET uh, 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 training that's been done at the, at, the, at the mines. But then also then comes to the issue of exposure to technology and how technology then influences the decision making at the mines. And that's why the, the, the likes of the SETCAP programs are quite relevant and are endorsed by uh, most of the uh, mining uh, unions and uh, key stakeholders within the mining industry. Thank you. Thank you very much for the answer there. I'd, I'd like to go to the next um, question. And uh, is there any growth in the local manufacturing sector? Is private business and government assisting SMMEs in this regard? Is any of our panelists prepared to answer that question? No, really. Thomas? Um, I'll make a comment. Um, unfortunately, um, I think the SMME sector is always one struggling in this country. Um, we've, we've had a traditional uh, focus around big business, and I think you get to a certain threshold and you can flourish, but small business struggles. Um, so yeah, it, 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 it's that regulatory environment that is extremely difficult to get into. Um, I think the mining companies are trying very hard. You know, this whole initiative of, of um, the uh, uh, enterprise development initiative, we as a company, uh, obviously to subscribe to the, to the scorecard, we, we, we put an effort in developing SMMEs as suppliers to us. But there's only so much that we can do. Um, and then we do see that the, the mine, mines themselves train up uh, and, and empower their supplies within the communities. They have that pressure uh, daily to deal with. Um, so they, 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 they're working in that space. I, I think um, uh, I can't you know, uh, give any credit to anybody. I think uh, the, 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 the regulatory environment makes it quite harsh for small businesses. Um, I have personally a small, a couple of small businesses that I'm invested in, and if you don't have the expertise and you don't have the skills at how to de negotiate, it's it's a it's a it's a it's a struggle to to start a small business and and get successfully get off uh, uh, into a sort of critical mass unless you have a big brother that feeds you or somebody that that holds your hand. So I think the enterprise development aspect of the scorecard is very useful. Um, and I'm I'm pretty sure that has helped the many companies as as we have we've helped supplies to us. Okay, great, thanks, Thomas. Um, just the last question as well. And somebody asked, as a geologist, my prediction is that the batteries will be more expensive than the EV shell in the century-based or on current global-based metal reserves. 
Is it regarded as a counterproductive for mining companies to invest in recycling technologies? Is there anybody that would comment? Okay. It's, it's our game. It's Everyone? our game, uh, Eric. It's our game. I mean, whether we call it urban mining, so, you know, you take a, a source which is called waste stream uh, from some sort of a, a, a waste plant, you recycle it. So, we, we're starting to get more and more inquiries into that space. But, you know, South Africa or Africa particularly, uh, we're still pretty good at throwing stuff in a pit. Um, the Europeans are far more advanced as far as that's concerned. Uh, but it, it'll, it'll come. The, the recycling aspect and the reuse um, will become, uh, it's, 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 it, it just takes time. Um, uh, and, and, you know, whether you're crushing it or using a magnetic separator or any form of physical or, or, or chemical separation, the recycling companies use very similar technologies. Thanks, Thomas. Uh, Kevin, you also want to comment on some of this? Kevin? No, 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 no. Yeah, Eric, if I may come in here. Yes, um, please. I, 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 yes. I think it's, it's also important to, to, to highlight that, uh, you know, there has been, a, a, again, strides done by South African companies looking at obviously you know addressing the elephant in the room which is the esg and some of the old towns that we have around Gauteng and all the mining towns and uh, you know if 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 one was to be able to attend the our upcoming mineship conference where we'll be showcasing some of these technologies that speaks to uh, you know issues of re uh, uh, rehabilitation issues of uh, uh, recycling and you one will appreciate that there is a lot of work that from a South African perspective, that companies have really put in the technologies out there that are looking at uh, reprocessing some of the dumps. And it's currently happening as we speak from coal to manganese to iron ore. And, and yes, you know, it's a it's a man of our business. And I think with the, the big weight of ESG being the, the big ticket to tick when you do business these days. And I think our, our manufacturers have shown that we are there to support the industry from that perspective. Thank you. Thank you. And I think we've got just over uh, nine minutes left. So while I've got you on roll, roll, can you come up with closing remarks and some inspiration that will give um, the audience? I see we've still got 130 odd people listening in. Um, the way forward, the way you see it forward and, 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 and what's going to happen. I mean, you know, it, it's definitely not doom and gloom. Um, so please, can you give us some closing remarks from your side? Yeah, thanks, uh, Eric. I think one of the key things is one's got to be able to appreciate, um, you know, that we we are we playing in the global places as, as manufacturers in South Africa. But I think the Africa free trade area presents new opportunity, opportunities for not just South African manufacturers, but manufacturers in the continent. But I think the key thing here is collaboration. But from collaboration, also we've got to look at the issue of innovation. And innovation, that's where we, we are able to industrialize as a country and as a continent. But to be able to innovate, there has to be funds available to, 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 to support uh, uh, research and development. And I have to say, you know, really for, for, for the longest of time, there's been a bit of a discourse between uh, our manufacturers and some of the research institutions, which I think because now they're coming closer to the likes of CSR, the University of Pretoria, uh, uh, Vets University, UJ, and industry started to embrace this uh, uh, research institutions to get solutions for mining uh, uh, opportunities and also mining challenges. So I think the more we engage at the, at the regional and continental level on how best to innovate for not just mining, but just manufacturing sector in general. And that is why, again, I, I, I say, you know, uh, our mind shift conference, which is now the second year running, that's happening on the 15th and 16th of May, and we've got, you know, keynote speakers like Professor Glenn Noyla from the Vets Mining Institute. And we've got, you know, uh, Professor K. Wood that used to be at the Vets Mining Institute. Uh, you know, and, and all key stakeholders that, 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 are, that are key and understand the mining industry, understand the manufacturing sector. And I think it's important that, you know, in everything that we do, we see collaboration because that's key to survival and to growth in the continent. And as we want to industrialize this continent, you know, putting money into uh, R&D, as uh, uh, Thomas has said, that they, they can do more, but, you know, it's not easy to allocate that money for R&D. So we need to collaborate, find those resources from a continental perspective, then to be able to industrialize the continent. Thank you. 
Thank you, Leo Bonolore. And congratulations to Mims. I think you guys are doing an absolutely amazing job. And 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 we all need to stand together and work together to to promote and to get the industry, especially the mining industry, um, growing and, and, and growing at, at a good percentages of growth. Thank you so much. If I can call on uh, Thomas, if you can come in, if you can give us your closing remarks and, and, and some inspiration for our listeners of the innovation and what, what's happening in the process industry. Thanks, Eric. Um, I, I'd rather than talk about something um, that uh, motivates, I think I'm going to put a challenge out there. Um, you've heard both Rikesh and Kevin talk a lot about technology, um, particularly around digitization. Um, as a company, Multitech has spent uh, a lot of money, let's put it that way, <laughs> on this digitization initiative. We are a mineral processing company. That's our space. Um, and we found it very hard to find clients that are willing to try out uh, the sensor IoT technology and integrate it into their operating systems. Um, suffice to say that I think in South Africa, we haven't built in too many new plants. So the challenge of adding sort of a digital component into those plants is difficult. I think when you start with Greenfields operations, it's a lot harder, easier. But the challenge is to the industry and the EPCMs and the users to, you know, we've, we've spent a lot of money on developing the census to give you the data. And, you know, you hear it, data-driven decision-making. Um, get the data. We have the census. Um, and start integrating it into your operating systems um, and work with, uh, you know, unfortunately, the silo approach of everybody does their own thing. And your sensor doesn't talk to my sensor, doesn't talk to a platform that, that you know, that ultimately has to be collaboratively shared to start giving some meaningful information to a, to a plant operator. So we, I challenge the industry to, to, to and, and it, it does need to go through universities, it does need to go through maybe some of the EPCMs um, who, who integrate their SCADA and their um, uh, operating systems to talk to each other and, and, and welcome the source of data. We've got the data, uh, we don't necessarily always have access to the platforms. We do process the data on our own platforms and then give a report but it's working in a silo. It doesn't integrate the information on the plant across various equipment providers. So challenge to the industry, uh, we want to collaborate um, and it, it's tough because you are then talking to, to competitors and that's not necessarily something we're particularly good at doing. Yeah, especially in South Africa, talking to competitors and that's also because the, the pie is only so big. But uh, Thomas, thank you very much and I think well, let's hope that a lot of the people that are listening out there will accept the challenge. Um, if I may now go to Vikesh, and, and again, Vikesh, if you can come in. Also, just your closing remarks, and hopefully you have accepted the challenge that uh, Thomas <laughs> has put out there. Uh, Vikesh. 100%. Uh, I, I think, you know, what I'd like to close off with is you know, we've, we've spoken a lot about the the hard topics today, but there's two soft topics that I want to just raise that is extremely important in the innovation space in the mining industry. And those two topics are people and partnerships. Um, I think whatever we do within the industry, we have to take people into account, the people that are going to be using these innovations on a daily basis. Um, and if we don't take um, the people factor into account, we're going to end up in a scenario where we have a very clever solution that delivers no value. Um, and uh, the second you know, to the to the challenge that uh, Thomas has raised, partnerships. I mean, I think we we have to accept that in order for the mining industry in South Africa to advance, we need to be able to work together. We need to be willing to work together to come up with creative solutions that ultimately elevate the industry. So, um, two points, but of a challenge. Um, yeah, I'll just uh, end it there. Thank you very much, Eric. Well, well, thank you, Vikesh. And I think, you know, if I can add one aspect to that with when you say people and partnerships, and, and I fully agree, and I think we need to trust one another a little bit more and form stronger partnerships. I know that SACIC, we at SACIC, we could not help people export and do that kind of volume if we didn't have partnerships all over the world and partners that we can trust. And it's all business is related around people. Business is related around partnerships and trust. So thank you, uh, Vikesh. If I can go to you now, Kevin, um, 
last but absolutely not least, um, can you give us your closing remarks, please? Kevin? Yeah, I'd, I'd say the industry, um, I've been in the control and measurement industry, CNI, for over 40 years now, dominant in the petrochemical and power generation industries, the AEC uh, chemical plants and that, and measuring flow, pressure, level, rotation, speed, all of these things have just increased by better methods, but there's no new methods really being created for those sort of industries. Whereas in the mining industry, there's technologies around now that can give you real-time um, ability to measure, you know, people, processes, and assets. Um, of what so the advancement in in the mining industry, the the, the technologies is a huge improvement from being able to measure what actual ore without using it on on a, on a survey plan. It's actually now real time information with measuring the vice. So basic technologies out there now that provides tools for almost every sector within the mining to measure what you couldn't measure before. And that's basically process improvement. And if you can improve a process, you improve your bottom line without doubt. And obviously a huge improvement in quality. Your quality management improves. And um, like the case is saying, you know, the, 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 the measurement industries and people working in silos and that, and creating the platforms to be able to communicate is where it's at you know, at the moment. And um, I just find in the mining space, there's a lot of space for improvement with technology. A lot of things that you could not measure before, that the technologies now are available to measure. You know, I found 20 years ago when we developed this all tracer, the technology was way before its time. And the uh, Predominantly, it was resistance to change. You know, the older guy, it's resistance to change. Now that people are growing up with the, with technology everywhere, so we find that it's more and more easy in the digital revolution and unique um, identification methodologies. And it's just made things much easier. So the technologies are out there. And Thank you, Kevin. And, and yes, and and, and 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 so we come to the end of, of this webinar. And if I can just summarize, if you have a look, what was said between Kevin Vikesh, Thomas, and Lennon Hololo, it's it's absolutely amazing what is happening in our mining um, industries, and it's amazing the technology that South Africa has got over the mm. hundred years or hundred and fifty years of mining and where we started. And I'm, I'm always very proud that when I travel around the world, which I do quite often, is and I go and see mining companies, how many South Africans are heading up mining companies around the world and how many are heading up the technical decisions around the world. And that just goes to show that the, the basics, the background, the basic knowledge of mining, the mining technology does come from South Africa, whether it's deep mining or open pit mining, somewhere along the line, if you travel around the world, South Africa is part of it. And all we can hope and wish for is that through hard work, and you can see the guys are doing incredibly good work and incredibly hard work um, in the technology space of mines. And if you look at the technology nowadays happening in mines, it's, it's absolutely mind-blowing to actually see what is happening in the mines with technology. So just as a reminder to all our visitors, both locally and internationally, Please do remember Electro Mining Africa is around the corner in September. And if you want to meet up with Kevin Vikesh, Thomas, Ole Holono, please go there. You can meet their companies. You can see the technology that everybody was talking about. Um, you can see what's happening. It's a mind-blowing exhibition. And uh, all we can do is, is say, let's take South Africa further. Let's take SA Inc into the future and, and go into Africa. And let's not forget about the Africa Free Trade Agreement and all the other free trade agreements we have got around the world. And let's invite everybody and showcase South Africa and the mining capabilities and the innovation in mining um, to the rest of the world. I thank you all. And I'd now like to hand over back to Shannon. Thank you, Shannon. Thank you. Thanks, Eric. That brings us to the end of our webinar. I'd like to take this opportunity to say thank you to our facilitator, Eric Brucherman from SACEC for enabling a frank and engaging discussion. 
Thank you also to our panelists, Mr. Malloy from Mining Equipment Manufacturers of South Africa, Mr. Holtz from Multitech, Mr. Chiba from Epiroc, and Mr. O'Neill from Samira Trace. Thank you to our sponsors, ABB, AECI Mining, Astron Energy, and Epiroc for their support in making this webinar possible. And finally, thank you to the attendees for taking the time to join us for this discussion on innovation in mining and mining services. We hope you found this event engaging and informative. We appreciate your participation. The next webinar takes place on the 22nd of May at 2 p.m. and will showcase the technologies to address mine water challenges. The link to register for that event has been shared in the chat. The recording of today's webinar will be sent to you in due course. And if you have any additional questions, please be in touch. You can reach us at shannon at creamamedia.co.za. Thank you so much for your time. Goodbye.